Kroiso, Borada, and welcome to this discussion, not so much about where we are now, but where we want to go forward as an economy in Wales, something that we might all wonder about in the middle of the night, or we might actually be running away from, to be quite honest, I wouldn't blame you. Uh, I have people representing a range of businesses, business types, business sizes in Wales with me, and uh, for the next minute, few minutes or so, uh, we're going to be discussing where we are now in Wales in terms of the economy and where we want to go. So those people with me are Nick Speed, who's from BT, Janine Gill, who's had 30 years in the childcare business, Shimana Pallet, who's from that sector that's been hit so hard, food and hospitality, and Trevor Palmer, who runs uh, a business service company. So let me just take you back a little bit and just let's remember what we've been through. Well, in March, when the pandemic hit and began to hit both our health, but also our economy, in fact, in Wales, our GDP, the value of all the goods and services when we go to work was in fact not too wonderful anyway. We were doing well on unemployment. We had considerably lower unemployment than the UK. But let's say it looked in January to March that the UK and the Welsh economy was somewhat fragile, partly of course because we didn't know what was going to happen with Brexit and how that would affect our economy. So where are we now? Well, unemployment in Wales is 4.6%. That's gone up considerably since March, but it's still a bit behind the UK, which is 4.8. But we've seen an awful lot of jobs go from our economy. The unemployment figures only tell part the tale. When you look as well at the economic inactivity figures, we actually have 42,000 people fewer working in Wales now than in the middle of the summer. So that's where we are. Some of us know in more detail why that has happened. Others of us have just felt, felt the effects. But less, less from me now. I'm Sarah Dickens. I'm BBC Wales and Economics Correspondent. And for you today, I'm just the glue. I'm the person introducing people and perhaps asking, hopefully asking the questions that you'd like to ask. So let's hear, first of all, from our team of people, from our panellists, about how this year has been for them and perhaps they can describe a bit about their business so we can understand what you've been going through. First of all, Shimana Pallet, tell us about your business, Alka Comida and Curado. So we began this year um, with the joyful beginning of a new bar ironically and we opened our bar just as the pandemic was hitting so that was the beginning of March. Um, so we started the year with full of hope for this new year and here we are now. It's been such a roller coaster. We've had huge downs, a few ups, more downs than ups. Um, and it's been, it's been a, a challenge that I wouldn't want to relive, but we continue to live it, aren't we? So we saw our business disappear, our, our retail business <coughs> remained, but the restaurant side obviously has gone. Our wholesale and I think the worst thing for us has been the lack of certainty and the constant stop starting. So the, and we, you know, we have responded in a creative and dynamic and flexible way. But if you're constantly being thrown from pillar to post and you don't, you, by the time you plan, it's now out of date, it's impossible. You know, I found as a team, we have survived it, but it's been like, it's been a challenge to deal with that uncertainty and I think it's the uncertainty that continues to cause us problems. And before I introduce some of the others, help us with this because um, obviously your sector, both selling food but also as you say bar, restaurant, um, you know that that's had to close down more than some other sectors but it's still you have quite a lot of cost even when you're closed down aren't you? Yeah well this is the problem I mean I really strongly feel that had we known at the beginning that this furlough scheme, for example, was going to be extended through till next March, that would have had a huge impact in March this year on how we would have approached the coming months. We would have dealt with it much better as a company. We would have planned more effectively. We would have um, dealt with our staffing sufficiently. We would have had a happier team and we could have been a better business and, and you know, generated more income and used less from the government. I feel that we are now dependent upon public finances and that's not what a business 
should be here for. We're here to make money, generate money, create jobs, and thrive. We're not, we didn't set out, none of us set out in business to ask for public money. Um, and I think had we had that certainty in March, and a bit of long-term vision from the government back in March, we would have all coped with this in a much better way. Okay, Janine Gill, remind us exactly what you do, because when I said you're in the child, been in the childcare business for a long time, we got no concept of how big your business is. You actually employ 80 staff, don't you? And you've been, what, part open and part shut? No, um, we've remained open throughout the pandemic. Um, we made a moral decision to stay open and to serve the essential workers as much as we can. Um, we felt devastated as we were given different messages right to the end of the 23rd at half past five on Friday where we were told to shut just for critical workers. So we lost 90% of our income overnight. And we also had further restrictions then with the furlough scheme as well. So for three weeks, we were told we could furlough just like any other business. And then three weeks later, we were told no, day nurseries could only furlough a percentage of their staff. And HMRC were heavily looking into that. Luckily for us, we didn't actually go over that percentage line at all. But being in a heavily regulated industry already and being staff reliant, and um, it's made it very difficult for our cash flow plans and forecasting forward. We had a massive growth in 2018 to 2019, and now we're just at a standstill. And just like everybody else on this panel, we can't plan further growth at the moment. Um, let's move on to Trevor Palmer. Trevor, you're very involved. Um, well, you employ disabled people, don't you? And you're very employed in helping, uh, in, in, involved in helping disabled people. So with your two hats on, how's your business? And how would you say disabled people have fared in this pandemic? Well, I, well uh, first of all, I've now got about seven hats I'm juggling. So it's, um, it's been very interesting because at the beginning of the lockdown, um, a couple of my staff uh, um, at The Shield um, and we all, we closed the office and the first week, uh, it was a beautiful sunny week, I sat in the garden and I was thinking, God, you know, what's, what's going to happen? Um, then things dramatically changed for me and I'm, you know, it's, it's, I feel guilty that my business now is actually booming and prospering. Um, I've had to totally change the whole concept of my business. We're no, 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 no longer providing services and consultancy work. Um, we're now um, supplying um, face masks. Uh, I, I developed a, a facial recognition face mask. Um, I was, um, my background is, is in design and, and manufacturing. And I was asked, look, could you try and get this together and supply us? And uh, I, I managed to find a, a UK um, manufacturer who was ISO 9001 9, accredited. And um, I've done more turnover in the last five weeks than what I've done in the last two years. So my business is actually growing. And I'm actually going to, in the new year, I'm going to be employing, employing more people. Um, and it's, it's quite interesting because now we're, we're all working from home. I've been, in my, I've been in my office four times this year, um, or since March. Um, and most of my staff haven't been there at all. Uh, it's only I've been there with my, I'm a disabled person myself, and my, my support worker or my PA can take me down there from time to time just to check the mail and such like. Um, but, the, but working from home, now with the modern technology, with, 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 we're using Zoom at this particular, for this uh, meeting, but there's several other ap applications. And, um, you know, that the, in the past, it's been very difficult for disabled people to work, um, mainly because of access to getting to and from work. Um, and, um, employ employers uh, not having the facilities where disabled people can work. Well, now working from home is a little bit different. If providing you've got the right uh, technology available, you can work from home. So my, I'm now looking into sort of like purchasing the, the right equipment and be able to train people on so they can work from home. 
and to, to join my team because it's, 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 it's prospering. So yeah, for, as far as my business is concerned, it's not seen been so bad, but of course, I mean, you know, I'm, I am an exception and I appreciate that uh, because I know a lot of, a lot of firms are suffering at the moment. And, uh, you know, I think later on we're going to discuss um, um, business support, etc., etc., etc. And I've got a few comments which I'd like to come in on there. Right, okay. Well, it's good to hear some good news. We look forward to those comments. And I was leaving you last, Nick Speed, because I presume that actually, ironically, it's been quite a good time for BT, has it not? As more of us rely on your services for, well, shopping, meetings like this, working from home. Thanks, Sarah. I think Trevor's articulated it brilliantly, really, and that, you know, he just really illustrates, you know, the opportunities that there have been for people to, you know, to change the way that they do business. And I think, you know, at the start of 2020, when, you know, we were looking at the decade ahead, you know, we all were anticipating that this would be a decade where we would change the way that we communicate and the way that we work and that technology would enable us to do some of the things that Trevor has described. Um, and, but we hadn't, of course, we hadn't anticipated just the way that it was all going to be thrown into fast forward, you know, in the first quarter of this year. And so, you know, from, from March onwards, you know, my, my colleagues in BT in Wales, the 5,000, just around 5,000 of us in Wales have, have all been really busy enabling people in businesses, you know, in Wales and, and beyond to be able to carry on doing their businesses. So the challenge for BT has been, how do we keep the country connected, but at the same time needing to keep our colleagues safe? And, you know, for us, the challenge has really been that lots of people that have been involved in, in that work, and, you know, we've seen a, an increase in the amount of people contacting us and asking us to help them, you know, by about 20% this year. And, the demand on the network has, has doubled this year during the working day. So you can see the challenges and pressures that we've been dealing with. But at the same time as you know, those opportunities have arisen and the opportunities to do you know, some fantastic and really essential things like you know, connecting the new fields and temporary hospitals that we've had around the country and allowing GPs to be able to do virtual consultations to, to reduce the number of people needing to go into the doctor's surgery. So there've been all kinds of incredible things that we've been able to do this year, but we've also had to do them at a time when you know, the people delivering those services have you know, been shifting massively to working at home themselves. So instead of people going into our offices in Cardiff and Bangor and Swansea um, every day, you know, they've, um, you know, they've been working at home and, and that has been, you know, brought about massive challenges and opportunities um, you know, as I think the other the other panelists have described today, you know, all of us have really felt it in this year of change, you know, regardless of the size of your business. Yeah, well, um, you know, I think we need, now need to move on to what needs to happen next and look to the future of it. And I, I do wonder, while you're quite happy at the moment, I do wonder, Nick, whether one of the things that might come up later is that actually our, uh, our digital infrastructure, if you like, our our internet and our 3G, let alone 4G signals, aren't good enough in Wales. We'll come back to that later. I think that might be part of it in terms of how we go forward. Uh, but but Janine, you know, you are very much at the heart of what makes um, an economy be able to work at its best or not. If people can't access childcare for one reason or another, whether it's financial or geography or whatever, you are absolutely central to enabling families to work, aren't you? What do you see, you know, if we move away from our own businesses to the wider, wider Wales, if you like, what do you see as the big kind of challenges now as we look forward? So obviously childcare has been underfunded for a long period of time, and there's many settings out there um, struggling um, to keep the doors open. The last statistics is four nurseries a week are now closing um, because they're underfunded and they can't recover. Um, for ourselves, we made the brave choice of staying open and it actually paid off for ourselves because we got to work with um, seven different local authorities. We already had partnerships with four of them anyway. 
but we got to extend our partnerships for that period of time and we you know we actually managed to recover slowly um, but even you know city nurseries are but there's a big divide between the city nurseries and the rural nurseries at the moment with city nurseries actually taking slower to recover because people are working at home and not actually doing that commute in um, and we're quite fortunate that our nurseries are in more or less rural areas and have been able to still pick up those people that are working from home. So we've seen the honeymoon period over. Lots of people thought they could save money by having their children at home with them. But as we all know, Zoom meetings don't work very well with children being around. Um, and we're hoping that if the Wales, as they propose, will go to more of a hub working, we're hoping to see that the economy will be spread out over Wales rather than just in big cities. So if we can get the infrastructure right, you know, like broadband right down in West Wales and things like that, then we could see the possibility of working in those hubs as a childcare setting. As you're right, people have begun to realise without us, you know, especially the NHS staff, they couldn't have gone to work during those first 20 weeks if there was an emergency childcare set up for them. And I hope that we've done our industry justice by being able to provide that for them at that time. Um, certainly as our company, we did ourselves justice and we're very proud of the staff that were able to do that because obviously we didn't know what risks we were taking at that time either for our own, our own health. Um, and we've been very, very fortunate. We've not had a positive case in any of the six settings. So that's a positive thing. But yeah, I think, you know, moving forward, as long as the economy can recover, I see it being more spread out rather than just in South Wales and just in Cardiff. And I see maybe, maybe Wales can see the opportunity to actually spread it out across Wales. And, and of course, you know, the Welsh Government has an aim of uh, 30%, one in three of us working remotely, but they're really clear, aren't they? they? They don't mean everybody working from home, but working from those hubs that you were talking about. Shimana, two of your businesses are not urban. <laughs> <laughs> Narberth and, and Aberystwyth. Do you see the future where the way that people are predicted to be com commuting less in the future using these hubs we've been talking about, that kind of thing, as an opportunity opportunity to kind of regenerate our towns and, and in many cases some of our poorer towns? Well, it has the potential, doesn't it? I mean, um, we have got Welsh Government offices here in Aberystwyth and I have friends who work there and I know up until this year they even though there was this theoretical you know we could work from Aberystwyth and liaise with Cardiff it didn't happen they would go regularly down so I had friends who were traveling two three times a week yeah. from Aberystwyth to Cardiff just to have a, a one-hour meeting well 2020 this is a, the good side 2020 changed that and it, they don't have to do that anymore and it was a ridiculous thing anyway and what it did was it made their jobs untenable so several of my friends moved went from Aberystwyth and took their families down to Cardiff because it didn't work and um, so maybe that's one good thing that's come out because that that will now be they will be enabled to stay in Aber it will keep those jobs and the, the people and those families in this area and hopefully spread across Wales. So that could be a good thing that comes out, yeah. And in fact, that would help us as a nation achieve uh, or get a bit nearer our carbon cutting targets, wouldn't it? But, you know, Nick Speed, last time I said to somebody um, in, in a web conversation with, who were in offices in London, that actually I thought that this was an opportunity for rural Wales. Um, they just laughed and said they'd been on holiday in rural Wales and tried to pick up a few emails and it was impossible because our connectivity was so bad. So we've got a challenge as a nation there, haven't we, Nick? And that lands on your lap. So, th thanks for that. I think you're, there's a, I mean, you're you're an example yourself. You're proving that you know you're able to you know to do these smart jobs of the future and not be stopped by technology where you are in Abergavenny. And I think you know your your contact your friend from London. You know, going traveling to um, you know accommodation to stay in somewhere in rural Wales. It's, we there's a there's a challenge there, isn't there? In that you know sometimes people want to switch off when they go on holiday, but obviously increasingly more people don't want to switch off when they go away and they do oh, want to be able to work in those rural locations. Yeah, but that so, was the thing. It wasn't yeah. about holiday when we might want to switch off, but Shimana was talking about yeah. people working long term. Yeah. 
Yeah, and um, I mean, you know, we uh, this this is a really important subject for us because um, you know at the moment, you know, we you know there are parts of Wales that aren't able to make the most of the technology opportunities and the, and the chances to you know to spread productivity and to spread opportunities around Wales, and we need to get to that situation where we can. So, you know. Um, I know Rishi Sunak's been spending a lot of money this year, and I think probably the only sort of one of the only sort of examples I can think of of someone that spent similar eye-watering amounts is is BT committing twelve billion pounds to getting full fibre um, out to you know to the whole of the country you know during this decade because it is going to be massively important that nobody gets left behind. You know, regardless of, of where they are, when so many of the opportunities and so many of the, the new jobs that we're going to need are going to depend on that level of connectivity. So, you know, there's a huge political focus on this. I think if we if we can remember back to the you know the general election that was just before this COVID period, we can you know we can remember that you know the parties were making big manifesto commitments, acknowledging just how important this is going to be to the economy. And um, you know we, we're ready to you know to play our part in um, you know making sure that that happens. And I think you know with this event today, thinking about the future for Wales and you know organised by the Senate, you know for me it gives us a focus on you know what, what how can we work with Welsh government and governments at all levels to make sure that we overcome these you know undoubted bar barriers that you know are still there and we we are going to need to overcome and. You know, um, I think you know politically, we it's important to sort of recognise that you know we we you know the, I'm sure you know I know from my post bag and my inbox that you know that the you know the politicians are you know on our backs on this one and and rightly so because you know it is it is going to be vital to you know constituencies right around Wales, but to to deliver that we need to work with the politicians who whoever's running the Senate after the elections yeah. to get the planning right and the regulations right and also to find the workers who are going to get full fibre out to some of the communities that other people on the panel come from here today. But we also know it needs to be financially and economically uh, accessible for everybody as well, don't we? And we know our communities that we're already the poorest, particularly in the heads of the valleys areas, we're already the poorest before this, have been hit hard, and we know that that will continue economically as well. But actually the level, I'll come to you in a second, Trevor, but the level of um, uptake of uh, broadband, for instance, is really low there. And that's even affecting children when they're homeschooled. So what are you going to do about that, Nick, before I go to Trevor? Yeah, on the uptake question, I mean, you find that the uptake question is like, is more challenging actually for the older older demographic than it is for for younger people and for families so for you know in sort of helping the Welsh government to you know deliver home education over the over the pandemic you know the the challenge there is getting devices out so that people have got a device to use in a in a household so that you know that they're not competing with you know for the, the children aren't competing for the one you know phone or device in the house and so that's the challenge there is getting access to devices so you've got to get access to devices to people and then you know you've also got to um, you know help people to understand you know what are going to be the benefits for them because a lot of the barrier for older people is to think you know should I spend my money on on you know on getting a, a mobile phone contract or you know getting broadband when actually they wonder well you know is this really going to be worthwhile for them but I think over the pandemic you know we've started to address that by people realizing that. You know, if you want to be able to see the grandchildren, you know, not just on, on the other side of the world, but grand, you know, grandchildren on the other side of town, then you know, this, if they want to be able to go and see the GP, if they want to be able to do the shopping, um, then you know, they, that connectivity is going to be key to them. So I think um, you know, there's, you know, we've all got these sort of challenges you know, in our own day-to-day -day life, in our own personal lives. And I think you know to sort of come on to you know what we want to talk about about the way that we, in our working lives. You know, again, you know, the, some of the technology that we need, you know, and could be support, supplied and supported from by these hubs to sort of you know reduce the amount of money that you're expect, you know spending to be able to to just be able to go to work. So I think that's probably where the hubs come in, 
and that sort of you know providing technology for people to be able to go and and do the work that they want to do to connect with colleagues around the country um do some of the sort of fancy whizzy things that they'll want to do from work Trevor, do you think that the connectivity is ex as accessible as nick is saying well, one of the things I told you in the new year, I'm going to be employing some additional members of my team. And, uh, you know, there's no need now just to look locally. Somebody has to live within a couple of miles from the office so they can get to it. It can be anywhere. Um, and obviously, you know, like, um, our, our, our main market is the Welsh market. We're supplying NHS Wales. Um, I thought, you know, let's get some people, perhaps some disabled people who are Welsh speakers. And, um, you know, unfortunately, because of the, the, the receptions, um, uh, broadband select, uh, coverage over Wales is not brilliant. But one, Nick, perhaps you can answer me this. Back in 2002, I was a member of the Wales Information Society, looking at the, um, um, the uh, putting broadband out to the, the the Welsh uh, population. I was, I was there as a, a, a time as a, I was a director of Disability Wales and I was a representative with Disability Wales on the, on the panel and uh, on, the, on the society. And we used to meet, we used to meet at the WDA offices in Aberystwyth, sometimes in the WDA offices down south. And there was all these promises, yes, the BT had their representatives on there all these promises are saying, hey, we're going to be doing this and doing that. And um, they're, they're, they're somehow, I, I appreciate the geographical um, complications there are of getting broadband everywhere. Um, but I would have thought with the modern technology, where that would have been addressed by now. And it would make employment across Wales a lot, a lot easier and for people in rural situations and to, 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 to become employed because that's the direction, that's, that's the way ahead for sure. So, I mean, it, it's interesting, isn't it? We used to talk when the word infrastructure was used, people thought we meant roads. We don't yeah. know, do we? Very, very so, briefly, Nick, can you answer Trevor's question? So, and then... so um, well, I think, um, I think a lot has happened since 2002. Where we are in 2020 is we're, we're in a situation in 2020 where there should be everyone apart from in three and a half percent of properties in Wales should be able to take part in a meeting like this. So, you know, regard wherever you are in Wales. So this, that means that there's 50,000 properties in Wales that can't currently take part in a meeting like this. You know, the challenge comes then if, you know, more than one person in a house wants to take part in a meeting like this. And that's why you need to get better connectivity so that people, you know, multiple people in houses can do this. Because we all know from the experiences of the pandemic that it's not just one person needing to be connected in the house at the moment. It's often several people that, you know, could be your kids that are needing to do the home learning as well as you and your partner both being able to need to go on video conferences like this one, you know, at the same time. So that's why we need to get to a situation where we're massively increasing the number of properties in Wales that have got um, uh, full fibre connectivity, because currently we're on 13% of the properties on full fibre connectivity. But with the right landscape, the right planning landscape and the right regulation landscape and the pipeline of people to be able to get to all of those houses that we need to get fibre to, we could actually by 2027 be getting to 100% um, to of people on full fibre connectivity and, and that would be transformational. So. Okay. Uh, I think we're going to have to bring ourselves slightly closer to 2027 and also I'm horribly tempted to ask you about 5G but we'll park that one for the moment. It's a long way till 2027 and I don't well, want to relive arguments of the past Janine about what support you should be now to have or what schemes are working well or not but you know you employ a substantial number of people and you enable uh, an even more substantial number of people to go to work. So it's vital that your business isn't one of the ones that closes, like you said, is, is happening. So what do you need to be able to continue your job and hopefully do it even better as we still struggle to get on top of the virus? So as an industry, we, we need support with the extra expenses that we currently have. 
Um, obviously, we, our PPE has increased immensely at the cost and the cost of cleaning. And also as well, um, the reason I'm working from home is because of the adult social distancing. So, you know, we've had to restrict numbers in our office and we've had to diverse off. But generally try um, to get the support out there for the families that need it. You know, Wales, as we know, is notorious for low incomes. So childcare costs are really difficult for some parents to actually fund. So, you know, we really need the government to step in and increase the funding, um, not just for three-year-olds. We implement the childcare offer, but a lot of people have to go back to work at nine months old. So, and there's very little support for that. Um, and we just need to be creative and take the opportunities as well. You know, and there, has, there has been opportunities throughout this and that's something we have learned. I mean, we certainly wasn't a company that was considered to be IT, but we certainly learned how to do that in 2020. So, you know, there is opportunities out there, but we just, as an industry, we need support off the government, not personally as our company, but as an industry to save childcare. Because I think it was the Joseph Rowntree Foundation who recently said in their Poverty Wales report that what was needed was kind of wraparound care, uh, ideally free or certainly very accessible financially. So, so that parents could go to work at eight or have to work till eight at night and things like that. Is that something you think is missing? I and mean, obviously we have the 30 hours free childcare that, that you know, lots of children get. And then there's other help with flying start. But do you think that that actually misses a significant number of households? Yeah, it does. Um, incredibly. And wraparound has really suffered with the pandemic as well because uh, we've had to restrict. We do wraparound in all our settings, but we've had to restrict the numbers of schools that we can actually support because of trying to contain bubbles. So obviously if a child is going to two settings, it's in contact with 60 children rather than just maybe the bubble it might have at nursery. But also as well, the support stops. So if people are on low income and they've had the childcare offer support, then it stops, but you still need childcare services really right up to the age of 10, 12, you know, and um, there is no support for those older children and funding. So, and it's definitely a demand there. We could have, six mini buses at one site and it wouldn't be enough. It's interesting, isn't it? Because uh, economists, um, you know, academic economists are talking now about how this pandemic has helped us realise the importance of cleaners, care workers, yeah. workers like the, the team you have. Do you think that, you know, in the way that we used to hold up um, sort of higher skilled, often male, sort of engineering jobs as, as the creme. Do you think, and then you're going to be recognised more as an industry, it really matters to all of us? I think we took a step backwards, if I'd be honest, um, into it. I've been a nursing nurse for 30 years and I've always introduced myself as a nursing nurse, not as a company director. It's always been an industry I've been proud of. But unfortunately, if you listen to news reports, we're never mentioned, you hear of teachers or carers. And when we asked where we were in this, which winner are we? Um, we, were, we were told we were carers. And then when it came to the 500 pound bonus, we were told we were not carers. Oh. So, um, and when we have paperwork, it's often aimed at schools and we are told to adjust it, to regulate it. Um, I've always campaigned to get the industry recognized. Um, we win many awards recently going up against British government and actually beat them in their own award a few months ago, back in March, before COVID. Um, and we, I do it because I want the industry to be recognised for what it was. I feel for my staff at the moment because um, as much as we recognise them internally, externally, publicly, you never hear them being talked about. Though I will say individuals, you know, NHS staff have thanked us and stuff like that. And that goes a long way. But I would like to have a serious conversation with Welsh Government and get us taken far more seriously than what we currently are. And Trevor, do you think that, you know, that will work for other groups across the economy as well? That, that actually this has been a time when we can rebuild to a certain extent. And that's an overused phrase. I, I know I don't mean it perhaps in the way some others do, but, you know, actually pause and think what is good that's come from this that we can redevelop and develop yeah. further. 
I, I think that, uh, like Shumana says, we've got to be really creative in, 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 in our approach to every, every aspect of business and our approach to business. And even business itself is, is, is going to take a whole different, um, it's going to look different. In 10 years' time, the Welsh economy is going to be not reliant on heavy industry, but reliant on, on small, medium-sized businesses and individuals offering services and, and contributing in ways that uh, at the moment, some of us might, we can't even conceive um, are possible. And do you see that as a positive or a negative? I see that as a positive, to be quite honest, because it's going to be a, a very good thing for, for, for uh, it's going to unite a lot of communities, it's going to unite a lot of um, um, diverse communities in Wales and I think that long term it's going to be good. The transition is going to be difficult and it's going to be costly and I think that uh, I don't know if there's going to be enough funds available uh, to support development um, this is something I, I think we're going to talk about later, um, but uh, I think we've got to look at we've got to look at things a lot differently. Um, the, the technology is taking over. And my generation, I'm not, I'm 60, 60, 60, 66 years old, and um, you know, like the technology has advanced so fast. You know, in the mid '90s, I developed the very first website on um, e-commerce e business in Wales, and it was real cutting edge at the time. Well, I'm left behind now. I, I, I can't keep up, um, but the younger generation can, and it's going to be the it's the younger generation is going to be the the the, the future prosperity for Wales. And, and Shimana, you know, one of the fantastic things about life is we're always going to need food. <laughs> <laughs> the type of food, the price of the food, and whether businesses can continue to offer us that is a whole other challenge in, in the medium term. You, you've said that a bit of certainty would, would help of what's going to happen and what's not. But in a way, you know, listening to you, I'm thinking, you know, you don't sell the most basic of goods. So how do you, how do you plan for a future where you don't know when you'll be closed down and you don't know if the rest of us will have the money to buy nice special food, let's say, as opposed to whatever we can just afford at the cheapest? I think this is what is sitting in our heads at the moment. I mean, I'm hoping that the next phase that we're going to go into, um, the four nations as, will act in a little bit more of a cooperative, collaborative way using a bit more long-term planning. I mean, we're already hearing, aren't we? That we're planning for, so there's some Christmas ideas going on and there's also some post-Christmas lockdown ideas coming out. And I think if we start to get these measures announced, we can start planning, we can start working out our staffing, people can start feeling more secure. And I, I think we can only remain positive. We can't, we can't work in a negative frame of mind. We have to remain positive and hope that there will be an economy on the other side of this. But yes, I'm fearful. It keeps me up at night. What is going to be left and will people have money in their pockets? And Brexit is on the horizon. I'm interested though that you think that, for instance, let's take, let's pluck a date out of our heads. Let's say there was another lockdown uh, in the middle of January. I'm fascinated by the fact that you would see that as a positive, as a good thing to know. Explain that to us, that, that whole concept that you'd be able to plan. Because I think some people not in business might think, well, she's just going to lay people off. It's not that, is it? No, it's not that at all. And it actually allows you to plan your staffing, plan your holidays, work with your team. They all know we're working in a difficult, difficult situation. If we can say, okay, middle of January, you can take your holiday then. We, they can plan something. Okay, they maybe will be stuck at home, but they can start getting their heads around something. Uh, the stop start um, change constant change is what is killing our industry at the moment because it is impossible to work like this um, and this is where you are more likely to lose jobs businesses are more likely to let people go when they don't have some certainty and some ability to plan so we are more likely to see businesses in our industry just disappearing 
um, which maybe could have survived this had they had some roadmap. So if we have, so, I know we are living in uncertain times, but even with all this uncertainty that is being thrown up from COVID, some degree of long-term planning can be done and would definitely help. And, and one thing that we have seen uh, right over Wales since March is people buying more locally, buying from the local shop because they feel they're part of the community or simply because they're not driving so far or and, and you've even got a rid of a car because they haven't needed one. So do you think that loyalty to people like yourselves, yes, you know, your cheese might be slightly more in Narbeth than the supermarket down the road, but that like loyalty, do you think that's a temporary thing or do you think that is something that, that you can grow on and that we consumers will continue that relationship? I, to answer your question, I, I can't really answer that. I feel as a company ourselves, we have a very loyal following already. And I think why, what, what the difference I've seen, the change I've seen is that people are spending a little bit more on nice food because they're not going out. And then once they taste maybe a wine or a cheese, it's a little bit more expensive and they experience how much nicer it is, you've hooked them, you know? So hopefully we're developing a more discerning customer base who are appreciating um, where their food comes from and appreciating why it costs us a little bit more and how much you get from it and it's very hard to find joy in life at the moment so if you can get it in a piece of cheese it's a win isn't it <laughs> so I'm gonna, in a moment I'm going to get you all to tell me um, your one priority that you think is the thing that we need to do most importantly to keep the economy in Wales going for the next few, few months. And while you think about that, Nick, you know, uh, we've been hearing about the Internet of Things and how that's going to change our life. That, okay, is a way off, but not that far away. Do you think that the pandemic has actually got us nearer to the position where, for instance, I could check that my mother is still turning the tap on a couple of times a day, so she's clearly okay, even though she's hundreds of miles away? It's massively brought the future forward, hasn't it, this pandemic? And I think, you know, as well as, you know, being able to do that and check up on your mom, um, you know, in, in the, you know, I think that's, you know, I think that's possible very soon. I think, you know, there are, there are ways that you can, you can do that and there are sensors that, you know, enable you to do that in the not too distant future. And, you know, technology that we're, you know, we've been using during this pandemic in, in parts of the UK, um, of you know mean that we're able to actually treat people remotely as well so you know diagnose people remotely and you know with 5g which you mentioned you know that it'll be allow sort of communication to be at a level where someone wearing a wearable glove in you know in you know where you are um you know could then um you know it could be sort of like you know, taking controls on that glove from an expert a medical expert that is you know in a you know center of medical expertise you know, in Cardiff, Swansea, you know, London. So, so not just watching over your mom, you know, using technology, but in the very near future, making sure that your mom, wherever she is, is getting the, you know, the, the treatment that she needs, despite all the other problems that could, that could be there as, you know, restrictions on travel due to a pandemic. So you know, there's, there's incredible things that are going on in, you know, in healthcare. And I think there are all incredible things that are going on to support businesses like Shimana's as well by using sensors using data all this you know internet of things to be able to you know to, you know, to be able to support you know all of our businesses in in what is going to continue to be really difficult times. Yeah, and I, br I bring that up because you know while we ha might have jobs lost as we've heard that there is a whole world that we're being told will provide us new jobs and you still have a bit of faith in that. I think there are amazing opportunities for us in Wales with this, but we need to understand and appreciate that, you know, that, you know, this innovation space is, you know, one where, you know, other regions and other parts of the UK are also looking to be, you know, first at doing some of these things. And, you know, I think, you know, if we can get the level of collaboration and, you know, that we've seen through the pandemic of bringing together, you know, business and government, we can also think really smartly about some of the opportunities for us to, to stay ahead of the curve, as well as to, you know, to deal with the really difficult things that 2020 has thrown at us. Yeah, so Trevor, come on, the first priority for you in well, terms I of... I think it's really important the Welsh Government, they've got lots of different arms, 
and they've got a financing, they've got a, a business rails can support new businesses to set up and existing businesses to develop. They've got to be a lot more creative in, in how they do things. Um, I've, I've, I've had dealings with them of, of, of in recent times. Um, they don't understand diversity at all. Um, I think that, uh, you know, if, if, if our economy is going to really benefit and it's going to benefit in what I call an alternative um, um, economy, which is going to eventually be everything, which is going to unite, unite, unite so many different cultures, people in Wales and, and organisations, they've got to be a lot more creative in their approach to uh, how, they, how they support new businesses. I know I said to keep it short, but what do you mean by more creative? Very quickly. Okay, right. Okay. Now, I, um, I, I've, I've, my business had a great opportunity of late. Uh, I need assistance to help. I didn't qualify for a bounce back loan because last year my turnover was less than 50,000 quid. I think I've done about 140,000 in the last six weeks. And I need money to develop uh, to, to progress and, and, and to expand my business. Um, I didn't qualify because I was less than, my, my turnover was less than 50 grand last year. So I contact them, they, give, they gave me a consultant. Um, the consultant, they're very nice, they did their thing. Um, but to be quite honest, it's not, not a consultant I need. There's too many, too many people who tell you how to do things, not enough people who can actually do things in our economy at the moment. And um, I, uh, so I had to, fit to go to all these links and now, okay, I've got one hand waving around. This, one, this hand works, uh, my other hands don't. Um, other hands, other, other hand. <laughs> um, and it, it, it doesn't have, my, my fine motor controller is not brilliant from the keyboard. And the way, the, the way their applications for funding are, are laid out, they're not accessible. Um, and if that's not accessible for me, to say, no, I, you know, it's only my hands which are not good, my brain is reasonable, but anybody who hasn't got the, 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 the language abilities or the, um, or the mental skills to be able to navigate around those systems, they're impossible. And I think that, that uh, you know, I don't know if anybody else on the panel has ever had any dealings with trying to fit in forms, especially government forms, you know, they're, they're not friendly, are they? So, <laughs> and I, I think, I think that, they, that they should really look at that and start involving people from diverse communities to work with them to develop things to help people. So uh, I think that would help our economy big time. So your two final priorities for the next few months, Janine and then Shimano. For me, I think the Welsh Government have got to improve their communication with small to medium sized businesses. I think the way forward, especially if you're going to work more remotely and locally, the way forward will be far more entrepreneurs opening up. And I think that the, the Welsh Government need to listen and communicate well with all these businesses and take on board what problems we are facing and what opportunities we think we can create. <laughs> Um, I asked myself to be part of the panel during the pandemic, particularly for the caring industry, and I got told no straight away. I was told they didn't need anybody from the childcare sector at all. So that's what I mean about taking a back step. step. They didn't realise the importance of what I could bring to the table. And listening to everybody on this panel today, there is a wealth of knowledge and they need to listen. And these are the people that can take Wales forward. Thank you. And Shimana, you have the last word. What do we need to do? So I would echo everything that's just been said by Janine and Trevor. Um, I think the government needs to act creatively. I would ask them actually weirdly to look at what Keradigion Council did here in Keradigion because um, they have been incredible, flexible, um, entrepreneurial um, and creative and acted swiftly. And in communication, not just with the sectors, but with the public. The public still don't understand the public health messaging, which means that the important messages are not getting across. So while we in all these sectors are suffering and our businesses are being damaged, the public health is not improving because people don't understand the social distancing rules that are required of them. So improve communication across the board, act flexibly 
and give some sort of long-term stability. Well, thank you all very much. And I wish you good luck for the future. Good luck to all of us and to everybody watching. Thank you. Deal.